six lecture of uh, David. Uh, yes, some some number. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, let's see. So. I assume everybody's had at least um, an undergraduate course in quantum mechanics. Um, who here has heard, if anybody, about um, a completely positive operator valued measurements or um, Krauss operators or quantum operations? Nobody. Good, because that's what I'll be presenting today. Sorry? Who has? Who has heard of them? Who knows about Krauss operators, quantum operations, partial traces? OK. Well, you might get bored, um, but we'll see. Part of it will be new even for you. OK, so um, recapping uh, yesterday, what Gurdje was going over was an alternative way of actually deriving many um, results that are formally similar and some of them actually completely identical to the results of, of uh, stochastic thermodynamics based upon infinite baths. So you have a system of interest and one or more baths. I'll usually just be referring to one bath, one reservoir. It could be a particle reservoir, what have you. But unlike in standard statistical physics, we're going to do this radical thing and actually get a little bit realistic and say that in the real world, even if you're coupled to an infinite external universe, effectively you are only ever coupled to a finite universe. Because for example, right now, I am not directly physically coupled to any degrees of freedom on Saturn or Jupiter. I'm only directly coupled effectively to a very, very small interface between me and the outside world. So one way to view that is as though I was coupled to a finite bath. And of course, experimentally, you can always set things up so that that is your physical system, just a system of interest and a finite bath, and we're just doing experiments over this, okay? So we start it. Yesterday, we were starting it as a product distribution. Some distribution over the bath, for example, a uh, Gibbs distribution. And there's some distribution over the system of interest initially. We start as a um, uh, product distribution. The Hamiltonian is the Hamiltonian of the SOI plus a Hamiltonian of the bath. These are, this is only dependent upon the variables in the SOI. This is only dependent on the variables in the bath. And then what makes it um, at all interesting is there's an interaction Hamiltonian as well. Okay? Then, because this is closed, it undergoes um, uh, deterministic um, ir uh, reversible dynamics. So classically, if these were classical degrees of freedom, like in the Jarzinski setup, it would just be a Liouville's equations are being applied, it's uh, being respected, and it's a phase space evolution. Today I'll be talking about the case where this is actually quantum <laughs> mechanical. So instead, it's a density matrix that evolves according to the Liouville von Neumann equation, um, a unitary. But, but the important point is it's deterministic and um, invertible. As time goes on, because of this term here, the SOI and the bath start getting coupled, statistically coupled. What we are interested in, though, at the end of the day, we are always treating the SOI separately from the bath. At the end of the day, what we want to then say is, OK, how does the entropy of the SOI change? Subtract that from how the expected energy of the bath changes, which we're going to just identify with the heat up at our level of the thermodynamic limit, and that's going to be the dissipated work or the entropy production. Okay, so that was all of it in a nutshell yesterday. And you get things like the detailed fluctuation theorem, and then some work um, subsequent to what Jarzinski did, some uh, other papers that uh, Gurdje ran out of time and couldn't present them. You also get just normal integral fluctuations and so on. Today, what I'm going to do is um, uh, try to present enough quantum mechanics 
so that we can actually derive for this exact same setup an integral fluctuation theorem. As it turns out, this is what's called, um, for example, in Nielsen's book, which is a great book, um, Nielsen and Chung, I think, yeah. It, Chung, yeah. Um, this is called, they call it an open quantum system. It's the word open means different things to different people. And uh, they talk about uh, their density matrices in that case and so on. So they don't think about it in terms of quantum thermodynamics. But subsequently, many other people realize that you could use it by taking this rather than being an environment, which is what it is for Nielsen at Alia, instead making it be a, a, Gibbs, distrib a, a Gibbs density matrix, and you can then do quantum thermo. Okay? So that's a preamble for today. All right, and as always, um, let's see, I'm getting an echo here. Um, how do I turn my video off? I mean, my audio off. Um, well, maybe that will take care of it. Okay, yes. Um, this, people aren't seeing anything, are you? Um, uh, I need the IT guy. Why aren't you... You didn't flip back oh, from no. me to the... No, because I took it off. Okay. Sorry about that. You have to reshare it. Okay. Um, let's see this one. And we are muted, so all's good, I think? Yes. Okay. Okay. No, that's not working, working again. Okay, well, whatever. Okay, um, okay. Uh, this is all ultimately based upon quantum mechanics. We will not take that as being in any sense um, indicative of how understandable the lecture will be today. So, a standard rule for thumb in your entire future, I'm now giving you advice for how to live your life, so pay attention. Whenever you're giving a talk, whenever you're interacting with people in general, I guess, but uh, I learned this rule of thumb when giving talks, um, you always start by telling the audience, it's a good idea to, let me not be quite so declarative, it's always a good idea to start by telling the audience something they know, so they feel smart, and then you tell them something they don't know, so they think that you're smart. So first you start off making them feel comfortable in their own skins, that their clothes fit right, and so on, and then you start taking them into a whole brand new wardrobe. Okay, so here is stuff that I hope everybody knows, and as always, Interrupt, because if it's something that you're not understanding, other people are not understanding it as well. So do at least have that working, yes, okay. So this is presumably the uh, perspective of what quantum mechanics amounts to, what quantum measurement in particular amounts to that you've um, encountered in your um, undergraduate um, course. You've got something you're measuring, position, momentum, spin, what have you. And there's an operator, a single operator um, uh, associated with it. In a, um, what's going on here? In some, uh, uh, in, um, some uh, process, and there's been huge bloody wars about what this process is, a measurement involves the universe applies um, uh, that operator to the system. There's wave packet collapse. Which means, another way of saying we use Kappa Klops is that there's in some sense a discontinuous um, non-unitary jump of the system state of the um, quantum state of the system to a normalized eigenstate of that operator. Okay? The value of the measurement is the eigenvalue <coughs> for that eigenstate. The actual jump, which eigenstate you go to, is determined randomly according to the spectral resolution, the eigen decomposition of the, of the system state and the Born rule, and it's required that the operator be Hermitian. Everybody on board with that? Okay, so that's where you just saw something that you knew. From here on out, for most of you, these will be things that you've probably not seen. Let's first, this you may have seen as well. Boy, this, things do not want to work. Come on, the world. For some reason, now the PDF, the Adobe, is no longer working. 
Yeah, today it's just not working. Um, I'm not sure what he did, but now my arrow keys don't even work. Yeah, that's why I'm figuring out dissipated work or something. Arrows are working. And so that wasn't. But but how did you get the arrows to be working? Just I don't know. <laughs> it's in the fingers. Uh, it's a magnetic field or something. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, but I mean this works and this now this works also. too. Okay. So we should be okay. All right, so anyway, so that's the standard picture. Here is something that's equivalent you may have come across involving what are called projection operators. Um, we still, um, let's see, we still have the a single operator associated with the measurements, and that operator we're still requiring that it be Hermitian. That means that there's a set of uh, complete normalized orthogonal eigenstates, A sub I, I um, indexes the eigenstates. Then you define what's called a projection operator. That's the um, a Hermitian conjugate of each AI times M AI itself. It's an operator, if you'll notice. It's not actually a single state. Um, the important thing to notice is that because these are um, orthogonal, that the product of uh, two projection operators, um, if they're identical, you just get back the projection operator again. If they are different, if those are projection operators for different eigenstates, you get back zero. Um, because since they're orthogonal, AI times AJ is going to be zero. Or um, AI conjugate, Hermitian conjugate times AJ, I guess I could say. And then, um, we're again, just like this is reformulating re what we just saw, the universe randomly chooses among these different projection operators according to this probability distribution. Because that M, um, if you'll notice, if you put that in there, that's going to be AI, AI. So this whole thing um, is going to end up just being the uh, eigen, uh, the um, determine the eigen spectrum that applies for um, whatever your um, uh, state psi is. Um, because of uh, the properties of the eigen matrix, because this is Hermitian, M, uh, M dagger equals M, we can just replace that M with M dagger M. At this point, there's no particular reason to do that, but you sh should be able to see that mathematically it works. And then we say that um, uh, now the discontinuous jump, according to these probability distributions, takes you to this state. The projection operator makes you go down to um, AI, and then that's the, uh, to normalize the probability distribution. And then because of normalization of probability, you have what's sometimes called the completeness relation, which, if you'll notice, the um, sum over i of mi dagger mi, which is equivalent to just the sum over i of um, ai dagger times ai, that's equal to the identity operator. OK? Everybody comfortable with that? Groovy. OK. Um, now let's um, uh, look at just a little sub part of that. Yep. So here I've um, written up again. And let's now consider some uh, extensions of this. In some cases, it will be um, restrictive to say that the operators are uh, mutually orthogonal and Hermitian. So how do we deal with that? So watch very, very carefully. There, that's how you deal with it. You just remove the requirement that they be normalized and Hermitian. Problem solved, OK. So now we've got a more flexible um, formalization. Also, in some cases, we're only interested in the probabilities of the observed values because it might not even be a state. Consider the, the case where you're observing, for example, um, what the state of a photon is with an apparatus that actually destroys that photon, which is almost always the case. The photon has no state after the observation. It's gone. Now, you can deal with this in using quantum electrodynamics and so on and so forth. But at this level here, um, uh, very, very clearly, you're not going to be interested in what the state, you're not going to be interested in requiring anything about the state of the system being measured after the measurement because it doesn't exist after the measurement. It's a destructive measurement. So how can you deal with that? Um, well, you just, again, very easy. Erasers are great things. 
So whereas before we were saying that uh, what the measurement does is it takes you down to um, this projected state like that, now we're saying, well, maybe it doesn't do anything. OK? This is a partial equivalence, no longer fully equivalent formally to what you're used to. OK. Um, so then there's these, so what this gives us actually is what are called positive operator valued measurements. This is an alternative way of considering, let me actually go back a second to this. Yeah, so if we go to this, um, these are what are, um, these particular measurement operators, M, that's actually the way that you will um, see the process of measurement considered in quantum computation. And quantum information processing, for various reasons, is much more convenient to use these kinds of operators, which are consistent with projection operator formalism, but can actually apply for other scenarios as well, to be working in terms of those, rather than there's no um, uh, stipulation of some kind of uh, <coughs> operator A with an eigenspectrum that determines the probabilities and so on. You just write down a set of M's directly. Okay. And in, all, and in many cases, it's sufficient to only um, be interested, to only be considering this um, uh, subset where you don't, the subset of conditions where you don't even specify the state after the measurement. And um, that's what are called positive operator valued measurements. Um, they basically, let's see, do I have it in terms of GIs? Yes, those are the GIs. So let me just go back one. So rather than in terms of these MIs, we can, we can abstract it even more, one more, one more level. A GI is a positive operator valued measurement. It's equivalent to what we were just seeing as M dagger M. And so all that we're stipulating is, um, uh, let's see, this should be, I'm sorry, that should be GI rather than EI. All that we're stipulating is the probability of which measurement value we get. So for example, when there's no photon, um, after you actually make the measurements, you will, can be using positive operator valued measurements. OK, everything from now on is going to be in terms of these measurement operators. OK, are people comfortable with that? Just think of them as being projection operators to guide your intuition. OK, all well and good. That was a reformulation of uh, quantum mechanics in another way. They're actually formally equivalent. It's not clear at this point what this will necessarily gain you. But now I'm going to present um, uh, some results which are actually easier to prove and derive using this new formalism. OK. so. Great. We knew Schrodinger's equation before we came to class. We've just been told all about these measurement operators. If we want to get exotic, we're not really sure we understand what it means to destroy a system when you measure it. But nonetheless, um, the big dude up in the lecture, he's just um, introduced us to positive operator value measurements. OK. Um, but in the real world, especially in the statistical physics real world, you're not going to be certain about what the state of your system is. Everything that um, he just presented was um, all about what happens when you know exactly what your um, uh, wave function is, what your wave vector is. The real world, remember the, uh, the lecture that I presented, all about definity and all that other kind of stuff, you're not going to know the actual state. You're going to have a probability distribution over states. So in the real world, what you're going to, so that means that in the real world, um, you're going to have what is sometimes called in the literature an ensemble, which is going to be a set of multiple quantum states and associated probabilities. You will see this referred to as an ensemble of quantum states. So, OK, if that's what I've actually got in front of me, how do I deal with this beast mathematically? Well, it turns out that something, a very convenient shorthand, is to express that ensemble in terms of this thing right here, which is called a density operator or density matrix. I want to emphasize, this is a sort of philosophical point that tripped me up until I learned to um, relax and love the bomb, as the saying goes. There's no sense in which that somehow is real. It's a tool. It's a mathematical tool that's going to allow us to start by um, uh, saying we've got this particular ensemble and calculate things like what will the ensemble look like 10 seconds from now, 
what would it look like if we were to do some measurements, and so on and so forth. This is just a tool that's going to facilitate our doing those calculations, the density matrix. Don't necessarily think of it as being real. You can if you want to, um, but you don't need to. OK? So um, a density matrix or a density operator, it's called a density matrix when you actually specify the set of states there. Um, in terms of some terminology, this is called a pure state if the PI are a delta function. Otherwise, it's called a mixed state. Um, uh, very, very easy to confirm that because these PIs must sum up to 1, that the trace of a density matrix squared, of a density operator squared, is an operator, so squaring it is another operator. Its trace is always um, between 0 and 1, and it equals 1 if and only if rho is a pure state. Basically, that's just reflecting the fact that if you take any probability distribution and, and view it as a vector and take its dot product with itself, you're never going to get anything um, greater than 1, and you will get the value 1 if and only if that distribution is a delta function. OK? Everybody good with this? Let me get rid of this meeting control. It's blocking my view of things. Um, I'm scared, though, if I try to do this, I might. Let's hope this doesn't lose everything. Nope, oh, that killed it. That is very interesting. OK, so we now know what the trick is. Let me just get it down then. OK, a very important point. Um, in general, this gets, yes, question. Then why did you only consider the case where the density would be the diagonal? Oh, um, in general, it need not be. Ah. OK. Uh, I want to know why you consider only the case the, the density operator is a diagonal matrix. Yeah, why it's diagonal? Um, because of how I'm motivating it. I'm saying you've got a bunch of states, and we don't know their probabilities. Mm -hmm. So in that particular um, basis, those psi i's, where I happen to know these are the states whose probability distribution I know, but I don't know which one of them, that gets you this density matrix. But you're um, uh, looking forward. You're exactly correct. In general, this will um, evolve to being something that's non-diagonal. But in terms of this motivation, we can view it as being diagonal. If you change the basis, it would not be diagonal. So I can always just take, um, rather than expanding it in the psi i, I can expand it in some other space. It's an operator, so it's just the normal similarity transform. So does that answer the question? OK, that means phi i is an eigenvector. Phi i. Pi I. Is it an eigenvector? Identical? Eigenvector. 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 P, P i is a probability. Phi i. Oh, the psi i. Yes. Um, I'm not here um, assuming that they're eigenstates of anything. This is just a set of states, and I don't necessarily know which one you're in, but I know a distribution over them. They don't need to be orthogonal. I'm not making any of those requirements. OK? Very, very general. Um, yeah. Now, an important thing is that, in general, two different ensembles might actually result in the same density operator. This is getting to ex actually exactly the point that you were just making. If I've got a different basis, then this will be a different. So in fact, you can also have two different ensembles, in both of which it's diagonal, but they're different ensembles. They have different PIs. And they're both diagonal, but nonetheless, they're actually the same um, density operator. So what that's telling you is um, even if you diagonalize a density matrix, don't ascribe too much meaning to the actual basis vectors of that diagonalized density matrix. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. Okay. And there are actually conditions you can solve for saying, when do two different ensembles um, represent the exact same density matrix in general and things like that. OK? OK, good. Um, and now this thing's not working anymore. Oh, come on. This has lost its amusement factor. OK. So, um, OK, so the first question is um, that we've now defined what that density matrix is. There's a set of probability distributions. 
And let's just say we're not doing any measurement or something. So we just evolve it forward in time. How does the density matrix, the density operator, evolve in time? Well, it's very, very simple to figure that out. Um, let u be the unitary operator that's evolving you forward in time. So we're assuming here, notice that actually the system is closed. Then we know that every single state goes to u of psi. The, um, uh, uh, the Hermitian conjugate goes to u dagger of psi. So by linearity, um, at the end of this um, dynamics, according to the unitary operator u, what we're going to be ending up in, rho will actually go to u rho u dagger. OK? Is this too slow for people, too fast? About right, kind of? OK, cool. OK, then we can also similarly look at, um, rather than um, a unitary, is uh, the dynamics when you're actually evolving across a, a non-infinitesimal amount of time. The dynamics when it's an infinitesimal amount of time, um, of course, that's a, a derivative instead. And we can use Schrodinger's equation to evaluate um, what the time derivative of the density matrix is. So the uh, plugging it in, plugging it in is always a very good idea. The less math you can do, the better it is. Um, always go after the low hanging fruit. Um, uh, the sum over um, uh, PI, so PI again, we're not changing that in time. We're not doing any kind of measurement or anything. You take the time derivative of this um, uh, psi, dagger, psi i dagger times psi i, um, but you then apply just the chain rule. It breaks up into two different terms. You apply Schrodinger's equation twice, one to each of those, um, and the re recall that the Schrodinger's equation for the Hermitian conjugate state, you're going to actually be conjugating the i, so it becomes a minus i. So what you're going to end up with right here is going to be the commutator of h and of the psi i. So in other words, this is the dynamics of the density matrix um, infinitesimally. And the reason I wrote it as h over 2 pi is I couldn't find a stupid h bar on my Microsoft so PowerPoint. So there you go. Um, this is called the Lieuville von Neumann equation. OK? So it's consistent, of course, with that one there, in that you can play the normal games, that you can write down what u is by um, exponentiating this beast right there in the case that the um, Hamiltonian is time invariant and so on and so forth. OK. Now, um, I've been very, very careful up to this point. Let me see. How, what would be good for how long to go for this first part of today? For the first, for the first lecture. Go to quarter two, do you think? Uh, you're asking about time? Yeah. Yeah. So actually, this morning, uh, we don't have uh, uh, because there is no lecture after yours. So this morning is just your lecture. So we are rather flexible. OK, well, we, well, we still need to go to no, coffee. Uh, <laughs> we still need to go to coffee at quarter two. So co there is no coffee break today. Uh, OK. So well, there is coffee here. Yeah, <laughs> uh, because there is no break. OK. Uh, <laughs> so, All right, so let so, me. Um, OK. So I'll keep going with this a little bit then, and uh, then we'll take a break. So, so far, I've been very, very careful to say, oh, the PIs are not changing because we're not doing any kind of a measurement. And that allows us to use linearity to see how the density matrix evolves with time. Now let's actually look at what happens when we do a measurement. And we're going to be using, as I mentioned before, these uh, measurement operators are a convenient way to do that. And again, to reiterate, to guide your intuition, you can just think of them as projection operators, where you're just projecting onto a particular eigenstate. So let's think about it carefully. If the state of the system is psi i, that's one of the um, uh, states in your um, ensemble, then the probability of getting a measurement value m, if you are in state psi i, recall the rules that we wrote down before. This is the probability for, um, we can, I can go backwards, will this work? Yes, so remember back here, yeah, this equation. The probability of uh, the measurement i coming out with the measurement operators given that you're in some particular state is given by this. So that we just apply that 
to each individual state i, and we get the probability of a measurement m if we are in state i is uh, just given by this expression here, which by um, the cyclic property of trace, we can rewrite it like that. OK? Also, um, uh, recall Bayes' rule from many, many lectures ago, which says that the probability of a measurement is just the uh, sum over all possible states you're in right now times their prior, um, uh, sum over all possible states you're in right now of the prior times the conditional of getting that measurement if you're in that state. We know what the PI are. This is how the measurement operator gives us the P of M given I. So you just plug it in. And this is your final answer. By linearity, if you make a measurement, um, the probability of the value coming out being m is the trace of uh, m sub m dagger mm times rho. OK, question. Um, in general, it need not be. It is when it's a projection operator, but in general, it need not be. Remember, we were weakening the condition of Hermitian by this um, great little expedient of just erasing it. So in general, it doesn't need to be. OK. OK? All right. Any other questions? OK. So um, if we are then going on, what happens to the actual density matrix itself? Well, also recall from uh, what, I, uh, what we presented in terms of measurement operators that if there is a state after the measurement in that particular situation, um, then each psi i, if you measure um, its state and you get the value um, uh, lowercase m, that each psi i goes to um, m sub m times uh, psi i um, over the uh, normalized, um, no, over the normalization factor. Plugging that in, again, using linearity, what that tells us is that if we actually um, measure, the dense, measure the state, we get the value small, and then the density matrix becomes this right here. OK? So the probability of getting the value m is given by this equation. And the density matrix, if we do so, is given by that equation. OK, so we've gone through dynamics. That's the unitary stuff and the uh, Liouville von Neumann equation. And here we've also gone through measurements. OK, and I'm thinking it might be just about a good place to start. Well, let me go a little bit further. Um, OK, so now um, let's uh, go a little bit beyond that. Uh, one thing that's very, very often of interest, um, either due to Savage's axioms and you've got a quadratic loss function, or uh, maybe just because you um, like first moments, is the expectation value of an operator. So let's say that I've got um, uh, some function f, which is a function of the measurement. See, m itself is just an index, that lowercase m. It's just saying which measurement operator said, yes, it's me. It doesn't have associated with it any particular value. Let's associate a value with every possible measurement. What then is the expected value of that, um, uh, of that measurement, um, now that we've got a value associated with it. And um, again, you uh, just use linearity. What you're going to be getting is that the expected value under a density matrix of any particular function, if you do the measurement, is trace of this beast right here times the density matrix. OK? All right. Uh, OK, yeah, I like this one. Um, this is to just give you um, a little bit of warnings about strange properties. It's actually not just of a density matrices, density operators, but of uh, the measurement process in general. Um, uh, basically, um, if a tree falls in a quantum forest and nobody sees it, it's still its density matrix changes. So what do I mean by this cutesy little phrase right here? Let's say, um, as always, we have a set of density measurement. We have a set of measurement operators. We perform a measurement. So um, that means that rho m, after the, uh, if we get the measurement value m, is given by this right here, as always. So if we measure the state of the system but do not know the result of that measurement, 
So something measures it. Over there, it gets measured. And we're not even saying what measurement is physically. Um, you could take an Everett from many worlds perspective, which I would adhere to, or if you're a, a, somebody who prefers like the Bohr's um, view of measurement, then you've got a real hard problem. But let's say there's a measurement over there that nobody actually knows the value, whatever that measurement um, process is. Well, since we don't know the value, that means that the density matrix by the standard probability theory is going to just going to be an average, um, is just going to be the, uh, well, the average over the possible um, individual measurements according to this probability distribution. So rho changes into this beast. In general, they differ. And so that's why the glib phrase that if a tree falls in a quantum forest but nobody sees it, still actually its density matrix changes. Um, it's in taking Everest perspective, it could still be that nobody sees it, but you do get entangled. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that was the yeah. Okay. Yep. Exactly. And that's one of the so so, that, so what Gilja is getting at is this. Um, the uh, very very good point. Okay. The, wait. Just repeat for the Zoom people because I'm not in the Zoom. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, so, so I just asked David if we take the Everett many worlds perspective, if we violate what he writes in the red text or not. Yeah. So it's a very good question. So um, it's a little bit of a, a aside, and this might be a good way to actually end this first part of today. Um, so people, I assume, have encountered this uh, huge wars about what measurement actually means in quantum mechanics, because the measurement process is non-unitary, and that violates all the axioms of quantum mechanics. Well, not all of them, but it violates, in any axiomatization, it violates one of the axioms. Bohr um, and others, um, uh, fellow travelers, famously said, shut up, don't think, just calculate. And that's um, pretty much the mantra. That's what you'll read in your textbooks. There's this discontinuous jump. Nobody's saying what's really going on. People like Wigner said maybe it's some kind of the, a collapse of the wave packet in the human mind. Nebulous, weird, um, uh, everybody getting mushy and squishy and basically um, uh, dropping too much LSD or something. And um, that's kind of what the standard traditional view is in textbooks. Hugh Everett, and he's got a, actually an amazing story about how he was abused by the physics establishment. But he, in his PhD thesis, which actually is a 20-page article in Physical Review that anybody here can read. It's a beautiful piece of work. He did this under John Wheeler. He simply pointed out that if you say that what a measurement is, is that you have a physical system over here and a physical measurement apparatus over there, and there's an interaction Hamiltonian which has certain properties, then after that, if you look at the state over here of the measurement apparatus, you will learn something about the state of the um, system that it, wasn't, that it got interaction with. And it actually, all the rules of measurement come out if the entire thing goes according to Schrodinger's equation. So Everett actually never used the word many worlds. That was, um, may have been DeWitt, I forget who that was, or Kip Thorne. That was somebody several decades later. But the idea is that each of these possible joint pairs of state of the system and the associated state of the measurement apparatus, each of them, some people say, is a different world. But really, it's just Schrodinger's equation. And so whatever it was saying was, ixne, undo all this crap about um, what mysterious thing happens under measurement. Just do Schrodinger's equation. And the reason that we right here see one particular result of a measurement apparatus is not because in some sense that's what reality is. Reality is also another set of us, so to speak, that sees another value of a measurement apparatus. You don't like that? Tough. The universe doesn't give a petunia about whether you are comfortable with something or not. That Schrodinger's equation explains everything you can see experimentally. You physicists have to change your brain to match reality, not the other way around. Don't get too full of yourselves, human beings. That's, one of the, that's actually, to me, the uh, primary lesson of all of quantum mechanics, that human intuition ain't worth crap and stop following it. So anyway, that's all of an aside. The reason that um, I'm, I'm getting at that is that that actually answers uh, Gilda's question. 
Because if a tree falls in the forest, if you make a measurement to Everett, that actually means something concretely. It means you, there is this interaction between the measurement apparatus and the system being measured. So people like Bohr and Wigner, they don't, can't say if a measurement is being done or not. It's this nebulous, undetermined thing. So um, for Everett, this is actually slightly modified for the many worlds view, where you would say, if a tree falls in the forest, and if it actually there's a uh, measurement apparatus that we don't get to see, but nonetheless that does actually interact with the system, in that case, it's density matrix changes. <coughs> OK? Um, one thing to notice, though, in general, um, whether you take the many worlds perspective or the Bohr perspective, um, uh, if rho is diagonal in a particular basis, and if the uh, measurement operators are projection operators in that basis, under those circumstances, the right-hand side of this is equal to the left-hand side. So if a tree falls in the forest um, and it gets uh, measured by something that's exactly aligned with the state of the tree, so to speak, then nothing happens to the tree. So in that case, you don't have a Zen twist. Okay? Um, partial traces. Let me just see what I want to do now. Um, okay, let's uh, take a break then, and I'll start to do quantum information theory when we come back. Okay, any uh, questions? Or if not, let's just take a five-minute break. Okay. okay. Five minutes break. Recording stopped.